What's up guys, Sean the Bro here, and today we're going to be going over our standard and timed match type in our Super Smash Brothers and Platform Fighter tutorial series. So if we go into our game and we change our mode, we set this up in the previous episode where we could change modes, but the modes were essentially all the same. So we can now change our mode and we're gonna be going over the standard and timed mode today. A lot of the logic we have in the series so far is for stock, even though we haven't specifically set up a stock mode logic episode, but we have lives, we have respawning only when you have a certain amount of lives, we have no time, we have uh, basically knowing who defeated who, which is setting up for score. We have a lot of logic for stock, but we have little for standard. So any shared logic is still there, of course, but for the standard and the timed mode, right, I'm considering them the same thing. Usually what will happen is there will be a timer at the top of the screen that is decreasing once it reaches the minimum value, which is usually zero, then the match will end. Once the match ends, there will be a score component who determines, you know, this will this character has this many KOs but got KO'd this many times or this many self-destructs. And so they will have a total score at the end, and whoever has the highest score wins. I'm not going to be going over scoring today. It will have its own unique episode. But we can go over the timer, and we can go over changes that need to occur when we're in a standard time mode compared to stock. So if we start up the game, you see already right off the bat, we have our timer decreasing right away as we're playing the game. So it's just decreasing constantly. And that's how much time is left remaining in this match. Now, you'll also notice down here at the bottom, underneath the mannequin, I don't have my stocks here. This is because we're in the standard mode, not stocks, so we don't have stocks to deal with. So if I want to throw myself off the map, I can go ahead and do that. And then I can come over here, and I can throw myself off the map again. Whoops. Throw myself off the map again. And I can do it over and over and over. And it'll keep letting me do it because I don't have a certain amount of stocks that I have to worry about, right? I can just keep going for as long as I would like. I have infinite lives in this mode. So like I said, score will be coming in another episode, but you see that we don't worry about stocks anymore. The stocks aren't indicated on the HUD because there are none. And we have a timer that is decreasing based on the real time left remaining in the match. It's not just a random number. It is actually keeping track of the remaining time in the match. This is good because it will allow us to also track when the game is paused and any time dilation can also stop or, or slow the timer or speed up the timer. So we're going to get all this set up today so that we have a lot more stuff that we can play around with depending on the match type we're on since they are so vastly different. Now we can go ahead and close this and we can actually load it up again if you're interested and check out the stock mode just to show you the difference. So this is probably what you're used to seeing where we have our mode, we have no timer, and we have stock shown below the character images. So at this point, if I am to throw myself off the map, then I lose my stock. You can see it already happened and then I go and I respawn. Right? And so this is what we're used to. But you can see how it's different from the stock in the standard mode because eventually I will use my last stock and I won't be able to respawn. So I'll kind of just be stuck here like this while the other characters fight. I can just spectate the rest of the fight essentially. All right. So in the previous episode, we went over changing the match type, but we never went over any of the specifics. Now we're going to start going over the specifics of the three main modes here. One is going to be standard and timed. Essentially, everything we've done before has been on stock, and we will have an episode on coined as well. Before we get started, I want to give a huge thank you to my YouTube membership, Patreon supporters, and subscribers. Thank you guys for all the love and support. I'm incredibly grateful. Really, really appreciative of all the support you've given, and I'm really just happy that you guys are excited to see this series and continue working on this series with me because this is so incredibly fun to work on. And I'm so glad that you guys enjoy it as well. So thank you so much for everything. Now, before we get started, if you want to get caught up in the series, I have a link right here in the top right corner 
That is the playlist for this entire series, so you can see everything we've done to date, as well as how far we are ahead of this episode if you're watching this a little bit after it has already come out. Alternatively, if you don't care about the entire playlist, but you do care about these different match types and, and changing their logic for different game modes, then you can click this episode right here. This is the previous episode in the series, and this is where we initially set up the enum for the different match types, as well as a few ways to configure it and set it up on something like the character select menu like we have here. With that out of the way, we can go ahead and get started. So today's episode is going to be a mixture of C++, so code and blueprint. We can start in the code today, take a look at what we've got there. In the base game instance.h, we had set up an enum called match type, and that is where we determined what type of match it was, if it was the standard or timed, the stock or coin. Of course, you can have as many as you want in here. But we never really did anything else with it. We made that variable then we were able to use it in the blueprint, determine which type it was based on which one the player selected on the character select, and then display it in the game. That was all we did with it. Now we would like to start doing some actual logic changes depending on the game mode that we're in. So the first area I'd like to go and change is in the SSB template character.cpp. When we're in here, we want to go through all of our functions, all of our logic, and we want to make sure that only logic specific to this match type is firing. So if we have a lot of logic that is related to coin, for example, we do a bunch of different stuff if they have a certain amount of coins. Well, that should be related to the coin mode only. So far in the series, as I keep saying, we've mainly been focusing on the stock component of the game. And so now I want to kind of break that up and separate them where necessary. There's not a lot of instances in the series so far, luckily. So we don't have to change too much that we've already made. However, one important one is lose life. So sure, you can lose a life in all of your match types. If you get KO'd, fall off the map, whatever. You can do that in every match type. But how it works is changed is altered by the match type we're in if we are in stock we lose a stock and if we are below the the minimum number of stocks like zero then we can't respawn anymore however if we're in our standard and timed mode we may actually just add to a score or decrement from a score of somebody else and they can respawn infinitely then it could work differently in coin. If you're in coin mode, you lose a certain amount of coins when you're KO'd, but you can still respawn indefinitely. So every single one can be different. In lose life, this is the main one for me. In lose life, this function in the character, this is what we had before. Right here. So we were checking to make sure that the character was not already in a state of losing their life. And if they weren't, we were setting them to be dead, making sure they couldn't move at this point and decrementing their lives. Then we were going into the highlighted text here, which is checking to make sure that the game mode is valid. And if it is valid, we were updating the HUD for the specific character that died to lose a stock or whatever it may be that we want to change. Then we checked to make sure they had more than one life remaining, and if they did, they respawned, else nothing happens, so they will not respawn. Okay, so all the text here and everything above 391, this if statement, was in this function beforehand. But now I'm adding a few new if statements to further separate the logic. The first thing we need to do is actually get our game instance reference. This is because the game instance is what holds the match type currently. The game mode also could hold what match type that specific game mode is, and it wouldn't be an issue. To get the game instance reference, it's very similar to how we do the logic to get the game mode. We make a variable, and I call it game instance ref, and then we cast the game instance to the type of game instance that we're looking for. So for example, get game instance is a standard function that Unreal has. If we are to cast that to our game instance type and it succeeds, we know that the game instance 
is this one that we're looking for. This game instance has variables such as the match type and everything that we set up in this file. So we need it to be this specific type. So if we set this variable equal to this game instance, then we can get the match type from it, which allows us to deviate the logic. So the comment here, if the match type is a standard or timed match, and then else if it's a stock match. So it's pretty simple how we're thinking about this now. The logic we had in here before was all for stock, so that'll go in the else if. Let's set up this if statement first, and I think it'll make more sense. So now you can do if and use the game instance reference that we just grabbed above. Grab the match type variable on it. That is our match type variable right here. If the match type is equal, equal to e match type colon colon e and then the match type that we want. In this case, we want the standard match type. That's what we're looking for here. Okay, so if we are, we know that we don't have to do anything relating to updating lives on the HUD. So you'll notice I don't have this in the standard if statement. In fact, all I have in the standard if statement right now, since we're not factoring in score in this episode, is just the respawn logic. And you can actually copy the respawn logic that you have from the previous logic where we were checking if lives are greater than zero. Just leave that if statement out and you can copy this. The respawn is going to be the same regardless because we do want to respawn. It's just we always want to respawn. We don't want to check and see if we have a greater number of lives because, well, we're not worried about lives in the time mode. Now, else if the game instance ref match type equal equals e match type stock. So if it's not the standard mode, it's the stock mode, then we want to do everything we were doing before. All of this is still relevant. You don't even have to add anything. We're just adding this else if, so that this only happens during stock. One important thing you could do is you could actually move decrement lives as well. It won't actually hurt us in this case. Since we are not checking to see if lives is greater than zero, we will always respawn regardless. However, you may not want to just decrement this for the heck of it, so you can move it and put it in this as well. Put it in the else if where you're checking for the match type being stock. That's up to you if you want to do that. It doesn't hurt anything either way, but I do think it's cleaner because that's not happening when we're in a timed mode, which means we know exactly what's happening in the stock mode and we know exactly what's happening in the timed mode. We're not making it more complicated by sharing things that we don't have to share. Perfect. And now, so lose life is actually supporting both the standard in time mode and the stock mode as well. And I actually don't have to change anything else in my entire code to make these work. That's the main thing that was that was separate so far, right? But you could have a lot more. You could be further ahead in the series or you could have implemented other things. And you may say, oh, I have a lot of these things that are specific to this game mode. You can go ahead and change them all. You're going to use that same method for all of them. Now, we're also going to want to add a timer. So I'm going to go to my SSB template game mode. And I'm going to override the tick function in the parent class. So SSB template game mode is a child of the game mode base or the base Unreal game mode. And it has a tick function in it. It's just a function that runs every single frame. We're going to want this on our SSB template game mode so we can do additional stuff with it, such as decrement the timer when we're in the timed mode. So first things first, let's go ahead and override this tick function. I wrote the comment here, but the important part is virtual void tick in parentheses float delta time override. The virtual and the override keywords allow us to grab this function and then override it in this class so we can write our own logic on it. So that's pretty simple. The rest of it is just a regular function, right? We just have to make sure that this does match the parent's signature for this function. So we need it to be void. We need it to be named tick and we need it to have a float parameter. You can actually change the name of this parameter if you want and it will still work. I tend to keep it exactly the same, just so that it's very clear that I'm overriding this function. 
Now, you'll also want to have a variable that can keep track of the remaining time of the match. So in the game mode, I have a float. This one I did make you property edit anywhere blueprint read write with the category of time because we are going to display it on the HUD. So the blueprint is going to need to access it. You can name it whatever you want. I called it float remaining time. Once we've done that, we can go into the game mode CPP. And we need to include our base game instance up at the top. Our SSB template character already had base game instance included for some other reasons. And so we were able to use it to get the game instance ref here and cast to this type in our lose life function. However, the game mode CPP has never had to use it, so we will have to include it for the first time here. So make sure you just add an include to be able to grab the match type enum. Then in the constructor for the game mode, you want to put a default value for your remaining time. This can be configured in the settings or options, so it's not a big deal if you don't put one, but for right now, we want to put one because we want to see it working. If you don't put one now, it's just going to be zero. No, it, you won't be able to visualize it doing anything. Just default it to 99.0, but you can put it to whatever you want. Probably minutes and seconds. You could keep it up to an hour if you wanted. You could display it as a time as opposed to just a number of seconds as well. There's a lot of things you could do with it. I'm just going to put it to 99. I'm going to keep it in seconds and just leave it like that. We can go over more advanced things with the timer later. Now, the next thing we need to do is override the tick function. We already wrote the actual override portion in the dot H, but we still need to fill it out and then do whatever it is that we wanted to override the tick function for. So you can write void and tick just like you would any other function. You don't have to do virtual or override it in the CPP. It was already done in the dot H. Make sure you have your float delta time. And then the rest of this is going to be what we want it to be. It can be whatever we want. In this case, I do want to call the parent ticks function. I don't have a specific reason for this yet. We may not ever need it. However, the game mode tick does do a lot of stuff. And so I want our game mode to also do that stuff. Just because we're overriding the tick doesn't mean we shouldn't do these things. And to call the parents tick, you can simply just call super colon colon tick and pass in delta time. So this is just a good way to keep the standard logic of the game mode going so that we don't override anything that we may need from the parent. So we'll do everything in the parent, and then we can do our own logic in addition to it. In this case, we want to do what we did in the character, where we grab a game instance reference. So it's literally the same line. We get the game instance. We cast it to our type. Assuming this succeeds, this variable is made. Then this variable can be used to grab the match type and then check against the specific match type to then do certain logic. If it's standard, we want to decrease remaining time by delta time. I will also say you can add a clamp or a simple if check that if remaining time minus equals delta time is less than 0, 0.00 f remaining time equals 0, 0.0 f like that and we can put this above and you could do something like this this way it doesn't go into the negatives and think about that the first time around not really a problem just might look a little bit ugly and also we do want to be able to stop it once it reaches zero we're not going to do anything with it now because we don't have any end screens we don't have any victory conditions yet in our game but we don't want to be going into the negative so you could do something like this you could also like i said do a clamp either way but this will work for now we only want to do this when the match type is standard Otherwise, we don't want to worry about the time remaining in the round. And with that, we're good to go in the code. 
So we can go into the editor. And the main place we need to go is our character HUD. Now in the character HUD, we need to add a spot for the timer. So just some text that we can bind to the timer. And then we're going to go through some functions and update them where we determine the visibility of our stock icons. So let's go ahead and do that. Let's add text to the screen, to the canvas, wherever you want. I'll show you mine. I anchored it to the top center, and then here are the values that I have. I keep this at 150, just so it's less ugly. You can put in your default value here. I put 99.59. And here are all my settings. You don't have to worry about really any of those because they're mostly visuals. Even this, this isn't really going to be what's displayed ever. This is just for what's on this HUD right now. We're going to actually bind it to grab the appropriate value, and that's what's going to display. Okay, so now if we click on our timer text, make sure you check is variable here. That way we can see it in the graph. We're going to use it on multiple occasions. And on content text, you will have no binding here. It'll just be the text. And there will be, if I actually get rid of this, if I remove the binding and I put in whatever I want, I can put 99.99. You'll see that I have this bind here with a down arrow. Click it and hit create binding. I already created one. I just removed it. So I'm just going to select that one again. But you'll be creating a new one. Once you hit create binding, it'll bring you to this automatically. So let's get these in order. And you'll have this. Get timer text, text zero. A lot of these functions need to be cleaned up and renamed. So for this one, we'll start with this one since we're doing it. I'm just going to call it get timer text. Something like that. Make it a little bit cleaner. And what we need to do here is grab the remaining time variable that we made in the game mode and pass it into the return node. The binding basically displays whatever in this text box that was returned in the bind function. We already have a game mode reference in here that we've used in other places. You can go ahead and use that as well. Since it is a binding, it fires every frame. So you might want to make sure it's valid. Just in case it fires before the widget is constructed, you could crash or get an error. So you can right click on your variable, convert it to a validated get, and you'll get this node here. Since this is an SSB template game mode object reference, it will have a remaining time. We don't have to cast it. You can get it. Then you should already have a return node that's in here by default. If you deleted it or it got removed, you can just type return node and add a new one. When you do this, it has a text value. Okay, the text is trying to bind the value that we give it to this text element. So it's a text field. Remaining time can get passed into this. It will just automatically add this to text float node here. That's what I have here. It didn't look the same, right? You can click this little down arrow and expand it to a bunch of options. You can change a lot about this. You have your rounding mode. You have always sign. You use grouping. Your minimum and maximum digits to display. For me, I actually utilize these a little bit. So I had a maximum fractional digits and a minimum fractional digits of the same number because they're actually normally different. And so when this is being displayed, I can pick all random, then this would be moving a bunch of different sizes, right? So if I have it at like a three maximum, one minimum, and I am to play this, you can see that's moving. It's pretty ugly. But I can keep it to where there are the same of each, and it will stay a consistent size. You can also do this for the integral. Those are the fractional digits. So that's after the decimal. But you can also have integral digits. So say I start the remaining time at like five seconds, or I reach five seconds, and I don't want it to display five. I could leave it as a minimum of two, which would put it as zero five. 
it would have that kind of notation. So you can change those as well if you'd like. At this point, your timer should already be working. So that was pretty simple. The other thing we want to set up on the HUD is the visibility of these icons. Let's scroll up to the top of my function list here. I have a bunch of functions in here, a lot of for bindings, but some we already had, such as update stock and set stock visibility. Now, set stock visibility was actually being used so that as lives were taken away, they would force these icons to disappear, right? So if we lost a life, we would hide it. That way, that stock icon wasn't there anymore. But we can also repurpose it to add some additional logic in here and make it so if the match type is not equal to stock, we just hide it altogether. However, set stock visibility was only called when we lost a life, not at the start of the match. So we will need to call them in event construct when everything's getting set up and pass in the appropriate data. Let's go into our set stock visibility function and get that set up first. This function was working by checking all the children in a given canvas panel, since it's the player one player card, player two player card, player three, player four, all these stock icons, right? So we were grabbing all of them and then we were checking the array index against the number of lives remaining. Assuming the array index was less than the number of lives, we should display it because that character still has that stock remaining. Otherwise, we should hide it. We're still using this, but we're passing it to an and now instead of directly to the branch like we were. Okay, so this was going directly into this branch, but now I've added these four nodes. What we're going to do in here is get our game instance reference. Again, this was set up in a previous episode. We can right click on it, convert it to a validated git like the game mode, and then we will be able to grab the match type from it just like we could in the code. From here, we can drag off of this and type equal equal to compare it. I will actually want the equal enum. We can compare it to a specific match type. So in the case above, I'm checking if it's equal to stock, because this means if we should display the stock and we're in the stock game mode, display it. Otherwise, even if we should display the stock, but it's not the stock game mode, we go to false, which means we hide it. For an and to be true, both parts have to be true. Even if this one's true, if this one's false, it's going to just hide it. But if this is true and this is false, we also want to hide it. So you grab this and boolean, that's what this is. Pass in both your booleans, pass that into the branch, and then make it visible if it's true, hidden if it's false. Okay, at this point, we can go ahead and call this function now, passing in the appropriate data. So we go to our event graph. We had the switch where we were setting player references on the HUD based on when they spawned and what their player number was. After each of those, we want to go and call set stock visibility, that function we were just working in. And we need to pass in the appropriate data. Now, it's a little hard coded right now. And this will be updated when we have more flexible amount of players in a game. It's not always just four. But right now it's hard coded to four, so we're gonna just keep track of four. Don't worry, like I said, it will be updated when we have more. But for now, let's assume it's for all four. So we wanna call this function four times and we wanna pass in the lives of the appropriate player each time. So we can drag directly off of player one reference and search for lives, get lives, and pass that into the lives function on set stock visibility. We can do the same for player two reference, player three reference, and player four reference. We also need the canvas reference that we're searching the children for. The canvas reference, again, is the stock canvas reference. So if I open up player one, for example, I have stock icon canvas. And it has all the stock icons in here. Now, we had used these before to pass them into this function. So we're just going to do the same thing here. We're going to pass in player one stock icon canvas. We want the canvas, not the individual icons. 
So for player one reference, we want to pass in player one stock icon canvas. Player two reference, we pass in stock two, player two stock icon canvas. Player three reference, we pass in player three stock icon canvas. And player four reference, we pass in player four stock icon canvas. You can search for them and get them. Or you can simply look through this long list of things on the widget and select them like that. Now, since this is on event construct, it will allow us to automatically set the stock visibility to hidden if it is not the stock game mode. Otherwise, it will update the stocks appropriately right at the start. Perfect. Now, the other thing we need to do is the timer. The timer should not always be visible. You could have stock that is also timed or coin that is also timed. Up to you how you want to do it. Right now, I'm assuming that the timer is only in the standard or timed mode. So I want to be able to hide the timer if we're not in that mode. So I've made a new function called determine timer visibility. You can make a new function by pressing the plus right here. And in determine timer visibility, we're going to do the standard check that we do where we grab the game instance reference, convert it to a validated get, get the match type, check if it's equal to a certain type. We're going to check for standard, plug that into a branch. If it is equal, we set the timer text variable right here to be visible. Otherwise, we set it to be hidden. To do this, it's very simple. You can grab your timer text, get it, type set visibility, and then you just select visible or hidden. We need to make sure we call this function, and I don't need to call it depending on what player we're on or anything like that. So instead, once we complete the players for each loop, completed, I'm dragging down here, and now I'm calling my new function, determine timer visibility. So there you go, guys. That's all I got for today, but now we can have different logic in our match types that it changes more than just text, right? <laughs> It actually can change the way the game plays out in the end. So we can play on stock or we can play on a timed mode. If this helps you make your different match types and you're enjoying the series, then please subscribe. It does more for myself and the channel than anything else you can do. I really appreciate it. I want to give another shout out and thank you to the YouTube membership and Patreon members and supporters. Thank you guys for everything, for all the love. I can't wait to see where we can bring this series. If you had any issues with this tutorial or any of my tutorials, feel free to join the Discord community. I'd be happy to assist you with any problems you had. Like I said, guys, that's all I got. So thank you so much for watching. I'm Sean the Bro, and I'll see you in the next one. Goodbye, guys.